Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Women in Tech podcast. I'm Tisha Poncio, your host, digital learning specialist for Wakelet. And my next guest is so cool. I mean, you can see she's already wearing the Wakelet jersey. So, I mean, come on. <laughs> I don't even have this Wakelet jersey, but I am here today with Becky Keen. Becky, I'm so excited to have you. Please introduce yourself to our listeners. Hey, thank you, Tisha. I'm so super excited to be here. It's an honor. And I, let's see. Okay, so I'm an educator, first and foremost. I've been in public education in the Seattle area of the United States for 20 years. I work now for I2E, which is a education consultancy company. And through that work, I get to work with educators and systems all over the world and app partners and do really, really amazing things. I recently wrote a book with Kathy Kurznowski and my passions are snow skiing, water skiing, eating and books. I love that. Those are also my passions. I don't think a lot of people know that I used to water ski and snow ski almost on a regular basis. Um, most recently I am <laughs> connecting with that side of nature that I love, but there's something about being in the water and just on the mountains, right? I, it's so healing. Um, and you were also in public education as long as I was. So we also have that in common. Um, I love your story. Um, so I'm going to be asking you some questions specifically about your story, but I also want to specifically pick your brain about education and education landscape and technology, which I know those are also huge passions of yours. So we're just going to get started. How about that? Yes. Let's jump in. <laughs> okay. So this question is not easy, but I really want to hear what you have to say about it, because I think it is a question that has been posed really often in the last 18 months, especially because of the pandemic. So how do you anticipate that the educational landscape will change in the next five years? Like, what do you see in the next five years? I know you're a mom, so you have kids, um, mm -hmm. you have that experience, you have the experience of working at I2E, you have the experience of public education. Where do you see education in the next five years? First of all, I want to compliment your positive supposition that it will have changed yes. in the next five years. I think that is wonderful. Um, one of the things that I um, have seen lately is that my middle school child is now coming home with a device. And that was something that hadn't happened previously. And what's interesting to me is that I was a part of a pilot group of teachers who started a one-to-one -one laptop initiative home and back every day in 2005. And so, and, and previous to that, I had taught fourth graders who took little handhelds home and back every day. So I've been in one-to-one -one a long time. And here we're, we're finally to the point where my little rural school district out, you know, across, I live West of Seattle, um, across the water. We're, we're, we're there and it's, it's been a long time coming. So I'm, I'm hoping that the physical spaces, this is my, this is my hope that the physical spaces in schools can evolve to match the level of access that we now expect as a society. So my friend, Emily Bannon, for example, she works in Tacoma school district near me. And, and that's her job is to help design new build schools and to help meet the needs of the students and the teachers. And my hope is that we now understand as a world what we can do virtually. And I think for many people, it's far more than we ever thought possible, but we crave human interaction. We crave being in the same physical spaces. We crave you know, being able to work truly shoulder to shoulder in many instances. So it's, it's it's my hope that all of the technology tools that we now have readily available, that teachers are now using, that kids have better access to, can be fit into a physical space in physical schools that's really conducive to that. We should have kids flowing through the building. We should have kids laying on the floor if they choose. We should have kids working in corners and going outside and you know, exploring their campus where it's safe and possible and all of that take, you know, grain of salt with any comment I make. So I hope that the education landscape 
we'll take the best we have to offer in the virtual space, but also partner it with the way that we can use physical spaces really flexibly. We should be allowing kids who are sick to join from home or kids who just need a day <laughs> at home to join yeah. from home, right? We should be allowing that, but we should also be allowing kids who are in a physical school building to interact with kids that aren't in their classroom at that moment. And yeah. it's so exciting to see that work starting to happen. And I think that a lot of times teachers need permission. They need permission from school leaders from, oh, here I go soapbox from, you know, system leaders to say, I don't expect all of your kids to be silently working in rows or listening to a lecture when I come in your classroom. I expect it to look like an adult learning space, which, which has not you know, been traditionally the look that we see in education. So I'm super excited about that. I want to bottle up everything you just said, <laughs> like, have it in a little, like a little doll, a little wakelet, doll. <laughs> I can press the button and hear that over and over because I 1000% agree with you. Um, not just based on my, you know, our experiences, but, but as a mom as well, I was mm -hmm. the teacher that was creating that learning environment. One of the things that I really noticed, um, and, and I took a moment to kind of take it in, but, you know, I went to visit, uh, the Wakelet headquarters yes. in Manchester, <laughs> a couple, like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And one of the things that really, even though I knew it was happening in the real world, but it really blew me away coming from, from that K-12 space was being able to go into this place where everybody had their own workstation. So shoulder to shoulder physical space, mm -hmm. but be able to walk to get coffee and just happen upon a brainstorming session right. <laughs> and be able to sit down on a couch and contribute to that. And it was that what you use the word flowing through. And I think that that is what is missing. Um, just like you said, in our education spaces, my kids, of course, have been in, in person, but because of the pandemic, uh, my middle, my middle schooler. So I have a sixth grader kind of middle school and yeah. a junior, they are, um, in an online public school. And it's one of, I don't really share this a whole lot, but it's a, one of the top five in the nation. And mm -hmm. what I have noticed about this school is it's that flow. It's giving those students that autonomy and also giving them the tools, like you said, the, the technology, but it's also creating spaces where they come together and they meet physically side by side, shoulder to shoulder. I just think my kids are flourishing in that environment. And I, I'm not surprised by that because I watch my own students do that and then start wondering why are the buildings not built for this type of flow, right? Why are we still sitting in a rows? Um, the teacher standing at the front of the room. Yes, I do. I am so hopeful, Becky, that there is a shift because this is the type of learning that I believe in. And I think it's the type of learning that is going to prepare our students for the future. So Absolutely. that was a great answer. I'm, I'm hoping everybody listening is going to quote and tweet this out because you solid answer, solid gold, Becky. I'm not surprised. I expected greatness from you. Um, oh, you're when so we sweet. Got on. <laughs> but I, I just say what's in my heart <laughs> yeah. all the time. <laughs> well, now I'm interested. So my next question is a little bit out there and I don't know a lot about this topic, but I have seen it in the news. And of course, if you know me, <laughs> you know, I'm a huge nerd. I read things all the time, specific to technology and the evolution of that. Um, so what do you think of the metaverse and how do you believe it's going to impact learning spaces? So right. maybe give some people what you know about the metaverse. Cause I bet you, our listeners have not heard of it yet. <laughs> Well, uh, there's, there's a lot to it. And I think, I think many of us can conceptualize the metaverse through games, right? We've seen multiplayer games for a long time where, you know, you're interacting with other people, you're in this space together, they are real characters, but their avatar is existing in the game. It's controlled by someone and the level of AI that has been you know, layered into these shared community spaces has obviously changed and, and been become amazing over time. Um, if you've watched Free Guy, the movie that, you know, came out recently, that's a great example of 
real humans who are wanting to engage with others in a physical space. Um, and, and, you know, there's, we could talk all just about that movie and all the implications and, and societal cultural things that happen. So the metaverse is essentially a way that we can interact with each other virtually that has many components of a physical environment. We might be in a room. I might be able to, you know, virtually take a, grab onto my coffee mug at a table and, and virtually take a sip. I might be able to, you know, with my character in a virtual space, walk to a whiteboard and write something on it because that's what I'm doing in my own physical world or that's how I'm controlling my character. And so it gives us an opportunity to, to have that layer of the things that we desire in a physical way. Um, there's been times my team is fully remote on I2E and has always been um, fully remote. And there are times where we think, oh, you know, it's like twice a year. This would be such a great opportunity to be in a physical space and put our sticky notes up on a whiteboard and, you know, lay everything out on a table and really work together. And, and we use different things to do that. We're on a team's call. We use whiteboard, you know, we, we make it work, but the metaverse is really about bringing those physical characteristics into a virtual space. Like we've seen with HoloLens, um, like we've seen with Oculus, all these other devices, and so it's, it's next level from some of the technology that we've already seen. And, and when we think about what that does for education and learning spaces, I think it's really fascinating. Um, I, I do, I'm with you on like, oh, I wanna read more about this because I'm a huge fan of digital. I have always been. And it's something that I think really can empower our learners to do things differently. We might have a student, for example, who, chooses to appear very differently in an avatar than they appear in real life for any number of reasons. Um, and there's a psychology behind that and, a, and, and all sorts of research behind what students choose and how they present themselves. And, and so it goes to social emotional learning. It goes to being able to collaborate in different ways, to be in a shared space, to, to communicate differently. Now we can look at body language and, you know, instead of being on a Zoom or a Teams or a Hangout call or FaceTime, um, but I don't want to lose track of things that are really important in life. It's really important to give people alone time. Some of our, our you know, standout, genius, world-changing thinkers are high introvert. And if you've read Quiet by Susan Cain, that's this amazing journey of, of acknowledging the importance of, of alone time, right? And so if we're, if we're constantly requiring kids to work in groups and be collaborative and be in a shared space, that's, that's not okay. It's not healthy, it's not normal, and it's actually not conducive and inclusive. So there's that component that I wanna think about in a metaverse. Is there space for kids to join but be independent, but be alone, but have quiet time. Is there room for that in a metaverse environment? I assume the answer is yes, but I haven't seen it because all the demos are everyone's in a space together. Um, and then the second thing I wanna consider is that not everything should be digital. We can't digital hug, we can't digital high five. We can't read body language the same way, even though that's growing very quickly and getting better with time, right? But there, you and I know in education, we've been dying to get back to our conferences and our meetups and our face-to-face -face and, and look at, look at, you know, what pandemic did to families and to anxiety and depression. And that's because we're not designed to be islands. So I do think in education, we always want to be careful that the technology doesn't replace the human component. Instead, it enhances the human component that we know is so incredibly important. Well, I feel like, Becky Keen, you have another book in you. <laughs> <I've> <laughs> this this could be a whole book. I mean, honestly, that you're right. Oh, about that all be a of, fascinating oh, book? That'd be so great. I really, you just I'm, took it. I'm all about this idea. But what I love that you said is that you really acknowledge those introverts. And it's so interesting that you said that because I was re I read a lot. I read a lot online about educational technology and technology, mm -hmm. but I also just read in general. 
And so right now I'm reading like five books simultaneously, like always, but one of those books, which I cannot tell you, I can't quote it, but I read it yesterday. And it said that emotional intelligence, part of emotional intelligence is being able to be by yourself alone and reflecting on those feelings. And I think you're right. If we don't give our students space to do that, if parents aren't giving their, their kids Mm -hmm. space to be alone, I I think we're doing them a disservice. And, And I do, I am all about balance. I think it's important to have the balance. I think we have to really come together and be able to serve all of those students and their needs. But I, I think it's big. I think it's going to change. I, I really force, I love the movie free guy. I went and saw that with my son, um, which actually leads me to the third question. You can oh. kind of see a theme here, Becky. There is a trajectory. I, I knew that the, the things that I could talk with you about, and they're all interesting to me as well. So that's why they're on here. But yesterday I was walking with my son and he loves to play video games and just thinking back to, he was born in 2010. And I remember giving him an iPad and saying nothing. Um, we were starting one-to-one at that point. So 2008, um, nine and 10. So I gave him this iPad and (laughs) I thought, well, let's just see what happens. You know, just being the ed tech nerd that I am, let let, let me use my kids as (laughs) the experiment. And so I gave it to him, didn't say word. And he knew exactly what to do with that device. And I remember being so blown away by that. Like, how does he know this? And I have a 21 year old as well. And so when I take my 21 year old, my 17 year old, and then Jace, who is almost 12, they have a completely different perspective of technology and how to use it. Mm. Um, Jay super confident. You can give him anything still, and he's going to figure out how to work it. My 21 year old is in a different generation and, uh, she is very hesitant, not super hesitant, but she doesn't have that, that you can just feel that risk taking. So Jace Mm -hmm. being the video game um, nerd, like his mom that he is, I mean, he's played Minecraft, which I have a question for you about that later. Um, He's played Minecraft. He's played Fortnite. I, there were lots of, of things that I was allowing him to do that a lot of parents weren't. And so yesterday on our walk, he's playing Pokemon loves to go on walks with me. We walk about three miles a day and (laughs) really it's because he wants to collect all these Pokemon characters. And I'm like, I don't care. You're getting some, some exercise. We're having some time together. You're getting to do this. So he asked me yesterday on our walk, why do the majority of adults believe video games are bad? And I, I said to him, I said, do all adults believe that? And he, you know, he kind of just looked at me. I said, seriously, do all adults believe that? And he, he kind of paused and, and he said, no, but most of them believe that. And he said, why are you different? Why do you allow me to do these things when other people's parents don't, and they're restricting them? And I said, well, a couple of reasons. One, I grew up in the video game age. Like I had the Atari, the Nintendo, like I had all of it. And I was playing it back then. Like I was so into it. And I said, so I know what it feels like to want to level up in these games. Like it can be addicting, but it also taught me logic and it taught me, um, you know, perseverance and it taught me how to be more of a tech nerd than I already was. But I said, I also got my degree in learning technologies. So I got my master's degree in that um, from UNT. And one of my classes, Becky, was called gamification. We had a whole study on it. So my question for you, what are your thoughts on gamification and learning? And really specific, I want you to share some about Minecraft and about your thoughts on esports. Because when I pitched esports long ago, I got a lot of pushback. So tell sure. me about your perspectives on those things. Oh, that's this is like, you know, I do whole keynotes on this topic. We could go for an hour. Um, it's it's a it's a huge topic. So first of all, um, when I speak about games in education, I speak specifically about game-based learning. Mm-hmm. And I'll just clarify for our listeners. So from a, from a very technical perspective, gamification is where we add game elements to existing materials or content, right? We try to make it fun. We add incentives. Game-based learning is where we use the game as the curriculum, 
as the tool to create a learning experience for kids. So those are two different things, of course. And one of the things that our generation can identify with very quickly with game-based learning is Oregon Trail. And it's the classic. Um, we all know what it is. And when I speak, sometimes I'll challenge the audience and say, you, you have a history as a gamer, you know, and I'll look out in the crowd and I'll go, who's played Oregon Trail? And it's usually like three quarters of the people, no matter the age range, have played Oregon Trail at some point. And I'll go, oh, oh, so you learned about, you know, dysentery and westward movement and, and hunting and, you know, and, and we could go with historical bias and accuracy and whatever, but we all have this background as a gamer and we loved it. And we might've played Reader Rabbit or Carmen San Diego. And those were all seen as nostalgic positives for adults that are now, your son is right, traditionally opposed. And so where did that shift happen? Where did we go from thinking video games were a fun learning activity that we were so excited to do as children that now we think, oh, it's a waste of time. You know, these kids are just zapping their brains with screens. And I think a lot of it has to do with some, some really, really fascinating um, content in the book, Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal. And she talks about how when we're looking for something greater than ourselves, which this generation that you're talking about, the 2010s, the 2008s, the two, that range of, of children, which I have in my house too, they are looking to do more with their lives. They're looking to experience things and contribute to things that they're limited in the quote real world in reality. But when we give them access to digital games, they're able to experience things that they can't access in a real environment. So that's extremely powerful. And, and so we, we can harness that in education by creating learning experiences within games that have, you know, all the elements of gaming where kids are motivated to finish, where they want to try again, all these game mechanics in a well-built game that really matter. And it, it can really shift. I, I do this little kind of challenge when I speak and I, I give examples of games in our world that many people ascribe to and don't realize it. Um, like I'm wearing an Apple watch, right? And I'm like tracking my rings and not everyone has an Apple watch, but those who do are, are like, I know what my rings are like today. <laughs> Right. And that's a, that's, that's gamification. We've taken the way we live our world and we've added incentive. Um, of course, Fitbit does the same thing and so on. So I do think there is a mental shift that's required in, in anyone to be able to understand really the, the, um, the draw of a game and the reason that so many people worldwide, millions and millions of people are so drawn into a digital space for competition, whether it's against themselves or others. And, and I think a lot of it boils down to they're getting an experience they cannot get any other way. And often they have more control over that experience. Um, and in a world where we often feel very out of control, um, that's a good feeling for a lot of people. So in education, we can use games like Minecraft, of course, is a super popular one to be using in education, one that I've spent some time, um, you know, creating content and lessons and, and, and ideating on worlds. I don't do a lot of actual world building. I leave that to experts, but ideating on the world and the lesson creation that goes into that and then play testing the world are some of the things I love to do. And that gives us an opportunity to let kids create, collaborate, communicate, and most importantly, learn. Um, Shane Asselstein, a phenomenal educator who lives in Hawaii, um, once said, and I quote him and I always attribute him, um, I can teach anything in Minecraft except triangles and circles. And that's arguable. <laughs> and so giving us, you know, a place where we can do those things, we can do esports um, in, in lots of games. Um, esports is now the the second most viewed athletic activity in the world, just right under the Super Bowl um, in American football. And that's, you can't, you can't look away from something like that, 
right? We can't look away from an environment that allows more kids to participate in what we hope is healthy collaborative competition and creation. Um, that's such an exciting opportunity. It's not something that I identify with readily. Tisha, you just said like you grew up gaming. It's you know something that you're a huge part of. I don't I don't self-identify as a gamer. I enjoy a game here or there. I'll certainly play if invited. I love board games and card games. It's it's just not something that I've ever spent a ton of time doing. So I've had to work really hard as an adult to understand the value of something that I'm not naturally drawn to. And I think that work is something that we all should be open to as adults, to stepping into the world of another person, another generation, and understanding what they're getting out of this experience that is healthy and exciting and powerful. And then acknowledging like anything in our world, it can be used poorly as well. Yeah. Absolutely. No. And you already answered my next question, which is actually yeah. what is one thing educators and parents can do to prepare learners for the future? I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Being able to put yourself in that perspective. And I think for me, a couple of things I was thinking about as you were sharing um, that we've already hit on a couple of times, but you know, what does that experience give to that student that they're not getting in real life. For me growing up, I was, it was really an escape reading and video games for me was an escape. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do not shy away from telling people that I did not have an awesome childhood. It mm -hmm. appeared that way on the outside, but it was very difficult inside of my home. And so for me, it was an escape. It was also an engagement. Like I was able to engage and successfully beat levels where I wasn't feeling super successful within that family core unit. Sure. So I think I, you know, we did not, obviously we did not have the community gaming like there is now, but I, I think I would have loved that. Of course, I like to join AOL, Becky. I know you're not surprised by that. I was like, where are the chat rooms? Where are the people? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was never afraid of that. And I think that's what it is. I, I approach parenting in the same way. I was the parent that gave my students or my, my kids actually, specifically my kids and my students, but gave them social media when they were 12, um, gave them a phone because my philosophy was they're still listening to me and I can still guide and mentor them through this process. Whereas when they're 18, I could just tell you, like, like you have to let go at some point And by 21, right. they're gone. Right. <laughs> right? Hey, like, right. You're out. You're like your parenting window. Is done. Over. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, it's definitely parenting in a different way, but you know, I approach it the same way. There was a, a TikTok video that I saw yesterday, I believe. And it was a teacher talking about, you know, if we continue to hold back as parents and teachers from letting our students experience these things, um, we're not helping them in that future. So how right. can we do that? And one of the things I did, and I commented on the video was I taught my students digital citizenship. I think that is part of it, right? How to engage with each other online so mm -hmm. that they can also engage with each other in person when they're seeing each other. Um, I got a lot of pushback from that too. <laughs> I know you're not surprised. I'm the risk taker educator. That's like, this is a great idea. We should do esports, And everybody else is like, no. And I'm like, no, it's going like, to be a big thing. <laughs> I think so many of our systems are making fear-based decisions. Mm, yes. And yes. I understand that, you know, especially our larger school districts have to focus on legality and, and student privacy and, and safety. And that I am all for student privacy and safety. Yes. Um, but I also worked for an amazing CIO who, you know, looked around a table in 2008 and said, what are we doing blocking YouTube? Yep. You know, kids, kids are hacking our network to watch a math video. Like, uh, this is not okay. You know, so we were one of the, one of the first, we couldn't even find another school system that was like, yes, we're allowing it, you know, cause that was way back. So intriguing you, that you say that because I remember <laughs> those days, like we are blocking YouTube. Right. Nobody's going to go there. And I'm like, okay, but we're a Google district. <laughs> like, Hold right. on. <laughs> right. Like, well, uh, so the, I think, you know, I get an opportunity to work with lots of school systems, um, through my role. And, and a lot of times I, I do hear the like, turn it off. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. the gut reaction yeah. in the IT department and bless it. They're just trying to protect kids and services and, mm -hmm. you know, not have something blow up or, or implode. But on the other side, as educators, 
we need to be giving kids access. I a hundred percent agree to platforms that allow them to take calculated risks, to give us those teachable moments, because without giving them, you know, a situation where they could possibly make a mistake or fail, we are actually removing learning opportunities and, and I think failing in our jobs to prepare them for a future because they haven't had the, the opportunity to choose wisely. Hey, it's, it's like riding a bike with training wheels or, you know, my oh daughter my. getting her permit and I'm still in the car with her, which is a great right. thing. I mean, it's scary for me. I get it, but I also need to be in the car with her. I'm not just going to give her the keys to the car. They don't just give her her license. I mean, I think, right. you know, there are some similarities there. And of course, just like you, I see both perspectives. I was also I know you're not surprised, reading something today with Jace about silos. We were talking about, you know, how, how silos work. And when we're talking about, he was, Hmm. I think talking about like cultural norms and things like that. And I said, when we just live in a silo, no matter what it is, we Mm -hmm. forget the other person's perspective and their experience and and what they can bring to the table. I think it's the exact same thing specifically. Well, you are an incredible answer of these questions. I honestly Becky, you. cannot wait to go back and rewatch and listen to this whole podcast. We're still, we still have some questions though. My last question is kind of serious. I really um, just want to know what advice do you have for educators who are struggling right now? Because that is what I am seeing mm-hmm. everywhere. So what would you say to those listeners who are in education and just struggling daily, maybe by the hour? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. Um, my heart just goes out to people who I'm not teaching right now. I'm not in a classroom and, and I can't even volunteer in one of my children's schools. The other one I can oddly, but, um, you know, there's just a lot of, I, I can't even be in with, you know, with schools. And, but I went in and met with my son's principal a couple of weeks ago and just had a chat and about, you know, the things that I could do to be supporting them. And he said, my teachers are losing it. You know, they're, they're here but we're so tired and it's all I'm hearing as well. Um, And so I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm in a a good position to give advice because I'm not in the same space. I'm not on the ground, but I can also, I I can certainly, excuse me, offer encouragement um, and just say, you know, as, as a, as someone who has an education heart, um, who has a family who had, you know, whatever situation you're in, I would say to, take a minute and focus on what you can control because there is so much, um, someone, a a very wise friend said, you know, really a lot of our world is in the, the stages of grief somewhere. We're either in denial or acceptance or anger. And so somewhere along that trajectory, we've lost some things in our lives. We've lost freedoms. We've lost security. We've lost family. We've lost a lot of things. And so to focus on what we do have control over, um, making boundaries, you know, doing, doing your best and then closing the laptop, closing the door, closing the plan book and taking time to, to be, you know, not an educator for a few minutes. Um, those, you know, the, the pilings on of extra responsibilities that's happening all the time. We can't control that for you teachers. Um, but what we can control is what you put your energy into. Um, you can control your voice. You can continue. Jennifer Gonzalez did this amazing blog on cult of pedagogy that we should be, you know, sharing from the rooftops. Um, I share it every time someone says, you know, how do you feel about the state of education? I'm like this, you need to read this. Um, we can be sharing that. We can be reminding our key decision makers, board members, that, you know, adopting a new curriculum is not, that's not a good time. Um, things, things that we can control, I think is, is the biggest encouragement I have because there is so much out of our control and dwelling on those things is not healthy or productive. Yeah. So I I have to agree with all of that. Um, honestly, I, what really stood out and I say this to everybody, um, including the educators, you know, of course I, I left education, public education to work for Wakelet, um, at the end of this last year, but so I still have a lot of friends in that space. Um, and I have some who are really struggling. I have some who are thriving. So it really is, you know, just all over the place. But one thing I tell all of them, that's very inconsistent is 
be very intentional about what you give your energy to Mm -hmm. and who you are giving your energy to and spending time with because they're so tired. Um, and, and I think it's just so important, like you said, to just be intentional and close the book and, and just do what you can. And, you know, I, as educators, you know, this, you're in that space. We never want to stop. We never want to stop giving. And sometimes we are always, I mean, oftentimes we were always in a deficit as an educator. I felt like I was always in a deficit. I did not have any extra energy for my family or even for myself. And of course I, I was there last year, you know, during the the beginning of the pandemic, Mm -hmm. but, um, I think that's great advice. And yeah, we, I will make sure that Jennifer Gonzalez, um, her blog is on this podcast w- along with everything else. Cause I've been taking notes. You would re- some really great resources. Throwing out some, <laughs> some of my faves. I know. So, um, now it's time for the rapid fire questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. These are, this one's going to be super easy. I know it's going to be easy for you. Um, But just in a couple of words, you could do a phrase if you want. Good tech integration means blank. I've got to go with increased student outcomes. Yeah, it's a good one. I know. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) this one's fun. What is one concert you will never forget? Uh, I saw Dave Matthews at the Gorge which is a huge outdoor amphitheater in Eastern Washington in 2002. And the views are amazing. Oh, I can't even imagine. Oh it was gosh. pretty fun. Yeah. What's, what's the last live music event you went to just since we're on the topic? Um, okay. Let's see. Maybe three years ago, my husband and I went to a Led Zeppelin cover um, in Seattle Um, at this, it was like, you know, a stand-up only, we were, you know, maybe some of the oldest people there. I don't know. Um, it it was really fun. Yeah. That sounds so much. I, I really, honestly, I've never visited Washington as an adult. Now as a kid, I, my dad took me there, but I really like, I just remember as a teenager knowing that that music scene was like the music scene. (laughs) Oh, we are known for our music. Yeah. Yeah. Certain, you know, certain genres. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay. Ted Lasso. We all know that Ted Lasso is a good show to watch. I happen to stalk you a little bit, um, because I wanted to know (laughs) Becky, what you were watching. And I saw that you posted something about Ted Lasso. And I was like, I think Becky Keen and I are best friends (laughs) because Ted Lasso, honestly, first of all, I felt like Ted Lasso visiting the Waco offices. <laughs> like, here comes this Texan <laughs> with all of her energy and excitement. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, and they weren't sure, like, at first, it was like a lot for them. So, did you bring cookies in boxes? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so funny that you said that because I went to my boss the day I got there and I saw something on Instagram. I was like, I knew I forgot something. I was going to bring you little biscuits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and she just laughed. I think it's so funny. We're obsessed with that show and really the majority of them have never seen it. So I'm like, anyway, right. I know it's a little disappointing, but lots of great lessons in Ted Lasso. What do you think is one of the best lessons from the show? Well, um, oh man, there's so many, I think that I'm going to, I'm going to go there. So one of my favorite parts is when Keely is like, oh, well, is this a spoiler? I don't know. It's okay. Oh, if you, okay. if you're watching Ted Lasso, just fast forward for you're the behind. Next, like, Skip 15 this part. seconds. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my favorite parts, even though, you know, Ted is the star, but I love when Keely like loses it at Roy mm-hmm. because he's just there like all the time. And she's like, I love you so much, but I'm losing my mind. And, and he's hurt and then he, you know, has some time to process and then he gets it and then he's very sweet in the way he kind of makes it up to her. I don't want to spoil it too much for anybody who hasn't seen it, but um, I, I love that whole dynamic because it's, it's him learning how to love on her. And her not wanting to hurt his feeling, you know, they're both just trying to do the best thing for the other person, but also still needing to be there themselves. 
And I think if, if we lived that way, you know, how it ended where, where we're like, okay, I, I want to know what you need and I want to help with that. And, and if we were balancing, you know, our needs with other people's needs as a, as a society, I think life would go along a little smoother sometimes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That was a great scene actually. And Roy, I know Ted is a star, but Roy is my favorite. Roy, like we- I like when I went to Manchester, I actually said to the team, do you think that you could set me up with a meeting with Roy? And they still are like, who? Oh, <laughs> oh no. Oh, no. Like, oh, well, I, I need, and I think he lives in Manchester. I have to do a little more research on that, but I really, Becky, I want to meet him because he's my favorite. I just really think he's so handsome. (laughs) He's he's pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and honestly, I mean, there's a million great quotes and lines in that show, just a million life lessons, but yeah, that's a, okay. Well, we're going to pick your brain now. What was the hardest thing about writing a book (laughs) and the most rewarding? Um, okay. Well, the most rewarding is for sure when it comes out and people buy it and they like (laughs) tell you that they loved it. And, you know, people will post like, all their little sticky note flags. And I think really, you know, there's not much in there. Um, and then we've had some, um, pre-service teachers tell us it's their assigned reading in college. And I just cannot be more humbled that people think, you know, it's that great that they would train teachers with the book. The hardest thing was probably the, the edit process, right? So we, our publisher is just amazing to work with Dave Burgess. And they said, you know, write, write everything and don't worry about taking things out or trimming or whatever, because our editing team will do that. And when the editing team first looked at our manuscript, which was like 55,000 words, they, they like really made some massive changes. They took out some things, they moved some things around and Kathy and I had to you know, step back a moment and not be defensive and not go, Hey, you know, I put that story in for a reason, but listen to the wisdom of someone else saying, but that they said, you know, you want your words to be powerful. You want every part of your, of your stories to be the most impactful, the most amazing, you know, so some of the things they took out and some of the things they rearranged. And then Kathy and I had an opportunity to work with them and say, okay, here are the things that we actually want to put back. And here's why. And here are some of the things that we agree in, in reflection. Yes, take it out, you know? So I think the book is like 36 or 40,000 words now. And that's a significant amount of trim. Um, and, you know, we were really set on seven C's and they, they had said, well, what if there were only five? And we're like, that doesn't work. And so we, you know, put that back. But the editing process is really interesting because you have to be humble and realize you know, this awesome thing you wrote maybe isn't awesome, (laughs) right? Or, or the way you had it flowing in your head doesn't make sense to another reader. Um, And it's hard to step out of your own work and see that, you know, from someone else's perspective. So it was a really interesting process, um, but also kind of difficult. We had to wrestle for a whole weekend with some of the edits that came in and, and deciding if we were going, um, Dave Burgess Consulting had said, this is your work. If you want it back, you can have it back. But here's why we think it should come out. Those types of conversations. And that's, that's a really, a really big growing learning experience. You know, what's interesting is that I really pulled in at the end of my teaching career, some peer to peer editing and like hashing out because I wanted them to be able to sit at a table and take that and reflect on it and grow yeah. from it and then come to, you know, like an agreement. It's very intriguing that that's what you shared. Um, I love that process. That's so so oh, can I just share one quick thing? Sure. Okay. This is a shout out to Steve Isaacs, my buddy who's in mm-hmm. New Jersey. Well, no, sorry. He just moved to, to South Carolina, but, um, cause now he works for Epic. Anyway, when he was in the classroom, he was teaching a game design class. And one of the coolest activities that he does is he has, he pairs the students up once a game is ready for testing. And the student who created the game has to stand behind the chair and watch as someone else plays their game. And, and they can't like lean over and say, you know, you're supposed to go left, right? They have to just watch someone Mm -hmm. else play their game and, you know, screw up and not know where to go and not know what to do or have a really great time. 
And then the student testing, it gets to leave feedback, but what an amazing yeah. opportunity for kids to live their game in someone else's shoes. I just speaks to what yeah. you're talking about. No, I did the exact same thing with, with the student portfolios on Wakelet. I mean, we went through several peer to peer, um, feedback sessions, and oh, the, yeah. very, the very first one, I mean, they hate it. I mean, tears and crying. And I'm like, okay, Oh. So, I, I mean, it really was, we really spoke to a lot of different things, social, emotional design thinking process. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a lot, but Here's those learning. students have come out honestly on top just so I think it's an incredible thing to pull into any curriculum, anything that you're yes. doing. Um, it's a great shout out. So Love the it. last question I have is what is on your phone screen right now? Right now? Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> I am so boring. Um, it's, well, I, I guess it's not super boring. It's fireworks. Oh, from, so I took this, um, on 4th of July, it's the fireworks over our neighborhood. Oh, like we that. were lighting up, you know, your own creation on your phone. I love yeah, that. I do I usually have my own, um, my own thing on there. And it's usually not a photo of my kids or my dog. I love them. I take a Me million neither. pictures of them. <laughs> but I don't need to look at them on my phone all the time. <laughs> yeah. Like I can see you. You're right there. I don't. <laughs> That's so funny. We are the same. I'm like, no, you're not going to find that on my phone either. Usually it's a quote, something that I want to remember mm. or something I need to be reminded of. A lot of times I do a yeah. lot of quotes on my phones. Well, um, I'll give you a trick when I'm out training or at an event mm -hmm. or a workshop or a speaking mm -hmm. engagement or whatever, I make the schedule for the day. My lock screen. Oh, look at you. That yeah. if anything, if you were listening, that is why you came for Becky's yeah. last tip. <laughs> if you finish this podcast, you just got gold. <laughs> Little Easter egg in there from Becky Keen. Becky, thank you so much for joining me today. I cannot tell you this conversation has like lit a fire in me. And I'm so excited about just education and gaming and life right now. And I cannot wait to see you in person. I you hope that's gonna be fire. like I just like soon. <laughs> You want it. Oh, yes, that would be wonderful. I'm oh. hoping to be, planning, planning to be at <laughs> some of the upcoming. We interviews. all are right. Like I keep thinking, okay, I have this on my calendar. It has to happen. Right. <laughs> I know we're looking forward to it so much. I like, I'm like, come on, my airfare is booked. Let me in. <laughs> Yes. Well, I have enjoyed this so much. Um, those of you that are listening, please make sure that you are following Becky. Um, Becky, what is your Twitter handle? At Becky Keen. There you go. At Becky Keen. Um, yeah. Make sure you Google search Becky Keen because then you will find everything Becky Keen. Trust I me, I up. did it. <laughs> yeah, I do come up. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please connect with her. And also we will in the show notes, put her Wakelet profile as well. You want to go check that yes. out. Um, make sure you're following Wakelet on all social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. A couple of us are on TikTok. And also make sure that you check out all of the resources, the notes um, from our previous episodes, as well as today's episode. Go to www.wakelet slash at the Wakelet podcast. And we will see you next time.